morning, Crossroads and Crossroads family. This is Pastor Bob Barker of Crossroads Community Church, and I am so glad that you're here with me today. I know it's a beautiful day. We had some, had some challenges here recently, which we'll talk about in a moment, but I'll tell you what, I'm glad that you're here, and I'm greeting you here on this bright, beautiful, hot, going to be hot Sunday morning uh, here in Dallas, Texas. I want you to know that I've been praying for you this week, especially this week. We've had a lot to be praying about these past few days, that's for sure. The coronavirus continues to go. California forest fires are, are just horrific. The hurricanes blowing through the Caribbean, the Gulf, Texas, Louisiana. And Father, we just thank you for that, that family of those that have lost loved ones and injured property all across Louisiana and going on up north. But I just want to let you know, I know that we've got even more things to be praying about. One of them is the upcoming 2020 elections. We really need to be praying about that. But you know, I know that our God will answer our prayers as well. The Bible says, it's one of my favorite verses, is the fact that God watches over His Word to perform it on our behalves. And I'm excited to see the miracles he's doing as he answers our prayers. Well, today I've got a message that I think you'll enjoy as well as be important to you. It's all about the truth. What do you think about that opening little introduction that I did? Uh, did it grab you? Well, I, I know it grabbed me. That's from the 1992 movie, A Few Good Men with Demi Moore, Tom Cruise, and of course the fabulous Jack Nicholson. I didn't think the truth was something that they, the public, could really take. That's what he was talking about. He says, I don't think you can take the real truth. But you know what? We need the truth. We need the truth, don't we? And especially now. Uh, many, many years ago when I was born, my parents actually named me Robert Barker. But they never really called me that. They called me Bob. So a few years later, you may know, you may remember, an early television program called, it was a game show called Truth or Consequences with Mr. Bob Barker. Of course, he went on to be the guest TV host of the game show, The Price is Right, which of course now Drew Carey does, currently hosts. But people in church, when I began to pastor, they thought it'd be funny, you know, at the end when I would give an altar call, people would come on to come and say, come on down. And of course, you know, jokingly, that would be something that we would know in the background. But when people came down to give their heart to the Lord or to join the church, you know, we certainly didn't make a joke about it. But uh, those people that did come up to me like deacons and things like that would come up. I'd make a joke to them and I would say, I know the truth and the consequences. And that's what I want us to talk about today. I want us to talk a little bit about the truth and the consequences. I want us to know what the truth really is. And I want us to start by looking over here in the Old Testament today. In Exodus 20, verse 16, it's talking about the Ten Commandments. And this is the book, the books, the plates that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. It says here in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. Let's read it together. You shall not give false witness against your neighbor. You shall not give false witness against your neighbor. And of course, the Ten Commandments were that first group of laws that we know about known as the Mosaic Laws. And I'm sure when you were growing up, you heard it as well as I did. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Which we know is false. Words can hurt you. They can trick you. They can mislead you. Personally, I think the truth is in short supply these days. Truth is something that we need to be able to make decisions on and to plan a future with. I've been watching the Democratic and Republican National Conventions these last couple of weeks, and I'm wondering if there's anywhere out there, anyone out there that we can really trust to tell us the truth. It's difficult. The polls show us that we think that we don't think that our leaders are telling us the truth. It's as if the candidates will tell the truth as long as it's convenient for them. And unfortunately, as the election draw near, draws near, I think it'll be open season on the truth, to tell you the truth. And I think we need to be praying for more discernment as we grow closer to the November elections. 
I think we need to be praying that the spirit of truth will give us a clear discerning mind and heart to know what our candidates are telling us, what their staff and what their segregates are telling us is the truth or not. We need to know that. I remember one after one election, a Texas politician summed up the reason why another particular candidate would be a horrible pick was it said that this particular candidate forgot the first rule of knife fighting, that there are no rules. And I think that's a mistake. There has to be rules. There is one rule that really towers above all others. We might call it the first rule of human relationships. And it's about the truth. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Or as the King James Version puts it, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. In a world where words are many and the truth is cheap, we are to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You could flip the ninth commandment around and read it this way. You must not tamper with the truth. You must not tamper or manipulate the truth. So this morning, what I want us to do is to take a quick little Bible survey of what the Bible says about lying. And I want us to start over here in the Old Testament. In Psalm 12, 2, it says, Everyone lies to their neighbor. They flatter with their lips, but harbor deception in their hearts. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been times when I've wanted to say something nice, you know, but there was really nothing nice to say. And as my mother and my grandmother used to say, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. And that's what I end up saying. So the problem with it is, is that we need to remind ourselves that it's better just not to say anything, not to say anything. Look over here at Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up, stirs up conflict in the community. So we're seeing here that there is a preponderance of evidence that lying is not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Falsehood is anything but the truth. Look here in Proverbs 14, verse 5. A truthful witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. Pours out lies. And if we get into the New Testament, we find out that the New Testament is in harmony with and in concert with the Old Testament. Look here what Paul says to the church at Ephesus here in Ephesians 4, verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. So we're supposed to remind ourselves that every person is interconnected to us. Look here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Well, Paul is really kind of referring to the place where he wrote the statement. He says, we are a new creation, so we should put off the old. The old being lying, deceiving, deceitful thinking. And put on the new life, the new man, the new creature, the new spirit. Not the old person, the new spirit, which is truth-telling telling the truth, always being honest. And finally, look here in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the cowardly and unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts and idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to a fiery lake of burning sulfur. He's talking about hell. So let's agree. The truth matters greatly to God. Not only does truth matter, 
But telling the truth matters. We could go on to say that God hates those who willfully choose to lie. The truth really matters to God, and that's the message of the Ninth Commandment. So let's talk about the things that this Ninth, ninth Commandment really covers. There are several different areas, and I want us to take a look at each one of them. So the first one is lying under oath. Lying under oath, or what the legal system calls perjury. This is the most basic issue in the view of the Ninth Commandment, lying under oath. Sure, it's wrong. We all know that. But we see our leaders do it so often that it doesn't seem, to seem, it doesn't seem like a big issue to us anymore. And that is corruption, where we assume that it's okay to lie and to present falsehoods as the truth. Look over here in Deuteronomy 19, 16 through 21. Watch here. It says, A malicious witness takes the stand to accuse someone of a crime. The two people involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in office at the time. The judges shall make a thorough investigation, and if the witness proves to be a liar, then do to the false witness as the witness intended to do to the other party. You must purge the evil from you. The rest of the people will hear this and be afraid, and never again will such an evil thing be done among you. Wow. That means if you said something false that another person would then be accused of, or, you know, judge having done, they find out that it's false, then the punishment would have been yours, would be yours. Let's look at this one, the direct lie. Now, what is a direct lie? Here we're thinking of the deliberate premeditated lie, such as when the time Jacob deceived his father Isaac by pretending to be his brother Esau. You'll remember the story in the Old Testament. Isaac is growing blind. Jacob and Esau are his sons. Esau was the older son, which should inherit the birthright. But Jacob puts a fur on his arm and goes in and pretends to be his brother Isaac, excuse me, Esau. And Isaac declares Jacob the one who gets the birthright, the, the inheritance. He deceives his own father and outwits his brother. It's premeditated. That's horrible, horrible, horrible. The next thing this ninth uh, commandment kind of envelops is the subjective lie. This is the lie in which you arrange the facts in such a way that while you're not directly telling a lie, you're allowing other people to believe that which is not true. Another example about that would be Joseph's brother, in the Old Testament, when Joseph had been sold into slavery, his brothers went out and dipped his coat, the coat of many colors, in blood and brought it back to their father Jacob. You know, although they had dipped the coat in the sheep's blood, they allowed Jacob to believe the, and come to a false conclusion that Jacob had been torn apart by wild animals, when in reality, they had sold him to become a slave. So they allowed him just to come to his own conclusion, even though those conclusions were wrong. They did not correct him. Keeping quiet is another thing that the ninth commandment comes into play with. Keeping quiet when you really know the truth. Keeping quiet is a lie. Because by not testifying, you are allowing either an innocent party to be wrongly convicted or you allow a guilty party to be wrongly set free. That is, I mean, that's unconscionable. Leviticus 5 verse 1, look right here what it says. If anyone sins because they do not speak up when they hear a public charge to testify regarding someone or something that they had seen or heard about, they will be responsible. So it's clearly lined up in the Bible that if we know something that would eliminate someone from being charged with a crime and yet we remain silent, that is lying. 
That is lying. That says that the person remaining silent will be held responsible for the silence. Keeping silent is a crime that God will not overlook. Another thing that this all encompasses here in the ninth commandment is slander. Slander is making a false accusation against another person. Now you might remember the story when uh, Potiphar's wife was guilty of slander when she falsely accused Joseph of raping her. Joseph had been sold into slavery and he gets into uh, the prison system and he's elevated. He becomes Potiphar's the right hand and he's an attractive young guy and Potiphar's wife sees that he is very handsome and he's anointed by God and she dresses in a seductive way and Joseph doesn't fall for it and he runs from her but even while running she is yelling rape. This is a vicious form of lying because it's usually passed along through gossip, rumor, and innuendo. Now I know that this case turned out to be a bad one because Joseph goes back into prison again but God elevates him and frees him and he becomes the number two person under Pharaoh. It's a tremendous story. If you don't know it, you might want to go back and read it. Look here in Romans chapter 1 verse 29. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips. Gossips. So Paul is letting us know that gossiping, innuendos, slights of telling the truth or not telling the truth, are really important. Here Paul lists slander as one of the marks of a depraved lifestyle. It's on the outward, it's the outward mark of someone who really doesn't know God. Can you imagine that? If we slander someone, it's a mark that we really don't know God. Here's another one that kind of falls into place with what the ninth commandment is talking about. It's flattery. It may surprise you that this is another biblical truth, but David condemns those who lie with flattering lips. Flattery is the use of insincere compliments. We call it buttering up, kissing up, sucking up. My kids, I mean, they would say, Dad, is it wrong if I compliment them? And I say, to what end? What's the reason? What's the purpose behind you flattering your teacher, telling them that you like something that they do? I, God hates it because flattery is used to gain an unfair advantage over other people. It's to insinuate a closer relationship, and we're not supposed to do that. Something else it talks about, careless exaggeration. Now, I know this is, uh, you know, I've heard it called, uh, let's see, what is it called? Evangelistically speaking, exaggeration. People say about how many people they have in their church, how many people came to the Lord this Sunday, things like that. Politicians talk about how many people they had at a meeting when we can see clearly that that's not the truth. And a lot of times, most salespeople, you know, most salespeople will simply overpromise and underdeliver. That's like when someone happened, you know, and someone makes a statement, you know, oh, your delivery will be on the 10th. You're going to get that on the 10th would they know full well that it's not going to be delivered until the 18th because the factory can't get it made in time? They know that. But in order to get the sale, they'll tell you that it's going to happen on the 10th. Something else is really not good is lying to God. I know people don't think that they lie to God, but let me tell you, in all of the years of ministry as being a pastor, and even before that, that's what happens when you make a promise to God and don't keep it. It's what we call foxhole religion. It means, simply means that every time that you're in a crisis in your life, we promise to serve God faithfully if He will just get us out of trouble. God, if you'll just keep me from getting this, this speeding ticket. Now, I got stopped here, I got caught doing this, and I got caught doing this. Or worse, you know, if we're in the hospital, this is what I have personally seen. I've personally seen people make a promise to God to do something for God. If God would just get them through this procedure at the hospital and everything would come out okay, 
that they would serve God faithfully for the rest of their life. Well, so, you know, they get out of the hospital and they suddenly have amnesia. <laughs> they forgot all about that. They forgot all about that commitment. I know someone who said, you know what? I will tithe if God will do this. And God did that and they didn't tithe. And I wonder why their, their life is in such turmoil. They don't have any friends. They talk about not having any friends. Why are we surprised? Because we've lied to God. It's like when you, when you go to church and you hear a tremendous message and you, you are inspired and you're awestruck by the message that, the, the, that has been given and you make, a, you make a commitment to God right there. And you say, when this is, you know, I'm going to make a change in my life. Well, when the service is over and you walk out of the doors of the, of the building, of the, hospital, the, the church, nothing happens. That's lying to God. You know, there's a story about two people in the Bible, Ananias and Sapphira. They did that in Acts chapter 5. When they pretended to give all of the money that had on a sale of a property, they put up some property, they said, when it sells, you know, we're going to give all the money to God. The problem was they were lying. And as a result, they were struck dead in the presence of the entire congregation of the church struck dead. Wow. That should be reason enough not to lie to God, not to say something. You know, I question to you, I, does that sound brutal? Then remember Ecclesiastes chapter five. Listen to what it says. It is better not to make a vow than to make a vow and then break it. So we shouldn't just be going around making statements about things we're going to do and then not do them. God hates that. So don't mess with God. It's better to keep your mouth shut. You know, people ask me all the time, well, what's so terrible about lying? Everybody's lying. Everybody lies. This person lies. That person lies. This, this position person lies. This one lies. This one lies to cover up that lie. You know? Lying destroys our society. It wrecks our homes. It's been known to split churches before and it fractures families, even poisons the best of relationships. You know, how many of us have tried to lie our way out of trouble, but like Dennis the Menace have gotten only in deeper and deeper? You know, in the cartoons and things like that, Dennis will make one statement to Mr. Wilson, the next door neighbor. He'll say something else to one of his buddies and he'll, he'll say something else to his parents. Then he can't remember what he said to who. I love what Judge Judy Scheinlin says. You know, most of her programs are, are reruns now, but occasionally she will make a comment in her court and she has a statement that she calls on quite often about the truth. She says, if you tell the truth, you never have to remember what you've said. You'll never have to remember what you said. Sometimes it's the, the little white lie that we tell or what we call the social necessary deception. There is no such thing. It's a lie or it's the truth. You know, I'm the father of four great daughters and they've all grown up to be really, really tremendous people. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. Their mother and I did a really good job raising our kids. But when they were growing up, as most adolescents do, they have problems with self-esteem and their, and their bodies, how they look and how they're presented. And, you know, I had that terrible question raised to me one day, Daddy, do these genes make me look big? First off, there is really no good answer to that question. And especially when you don't want to hurt your children's feelings. And you know that the, it's a temporary weight gain and that, that, you know, in a couple of weeks, they'll look really thin and skinny because their body's just changing shape all the time. But we don't want to say, you know, that uh, they don't look big or that the genes, whatever, you know. So we just, we want to say no. But we're forced to say, I was always forced to say, no, baby, it's not the genes. 
And they'd look at me and they'd go, Dad. And I said, do you want me to tell you the truth all the time or just some of the time? You see, sometimes we want to tell the truth. We want to tell the truth, but we know that it might hurt that other individual. We must speak the truth in love. That's what the Bible talks about, speaking the truth in love. And sometimes it may hurt, but it's better that if we will speak the truth all the time, then our friends and family know that when they ask us for our opinion, it will be a faithful opinion. It'll be the truth. They've asked us for the truth and we're gonna speak it to them. They know we've not colored or shaded it. Let me ask you a question. When you go to the doctor, do you want the doctor to tell you the truth? I've had that personally happen to me. I've gone to the doctor and I knew that the results were probable. And I had to hear those questions, yes, you've got cancer. But that's been over 15 years ago. So see, the truth, while at the moment may cause some disconcerting ideas and things that we have to kind of face, the good news is we know what we're up against. Let me ask you another question. When you're talking to your children's teachers or to your best friend and you ask them, do you want them to tell you the truth? And especially from our elected officials, don't we want to hear the truth? Don't we have the right to demand the truth? We elected them, we put them in office. They were elected, duly elected, but they're responsible to us. So don't we want to hear the truth from them? Yes. We all need to tell the truth. We all need to decide that the truth is more important sometimes than hurting someone's feelings. How we tell them the truth is really important as well but we all need to grow into the likeness of our elder brother, Jesus. The Bible says that he was the truth and the way and the life, the life, the truth, and the way. He is the truth and we should grow up into his likeness. And it's not always easy, but it is possible. So I wanna pray for you right now. I wanna pray for you right now because I know that some of us are in a position where we have to tell the truth to people who have asked for it. When people come and ask me about certain things, about guidance and direction in their life, I have to tell them the truth. I want to, but I am responsible to tell them the truth. We as Christians, as believers, are responsible to speak the truth. The reason is that is our witness. Our witness is of the likeness whose image we're made in. We're made in God's image. We are supposed to speak and tell the truth, not shade it, but we can speak it in love. We can tell them in love. So I wanna pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, right now, I thank you that you are the best example of the truth that there is, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And Father God, I thank you that each and every one of us today are aspiring to be like you. So we are going to think before we speak. Are there gonna be repercussions of me speaking what I'm getting ready to say? Then give me the words. I always pray when I'm, when I'm having to deal with a difficult situation, I pray that God will give me the words to say. And that's what I'm praying for you today, that you will stop for a moment and pray before you speak. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I just thank you for giving us your mind. Let your mind be in us. Thank you, Jesus, today for helping us go forward with the truth, expecting the truth in return. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I want you to know I'm expecting good things. I'm expecting good things for you. And I know for some people who have not found the truth always easy to say, that you're going to find it the right thing to do and to say. And I want to thank you for being here with me today. You know, each week I just thank you for being faithful, for checking in, and whether you watch the program as it's played on Sunday morning at 10 or some other time during the day or even on Monday. I know that a lot of people pick up the program on Facebook here throughout the week. And then some even pick it up on uh, our YouTube channel. So. Wherever you pick it up, I just thank you for participating with us and letting me know that you're enjoying the program. I appreciate all of those of you who drop me a note, message me on my phone, or drop me an email and letting me know that you watched the program this week and what it's meant to you. I'm hoping that the truth will mean something to you going forward as well. I just want to remind you to be faithful, and you are. You are the most faithful group of church people I know, and that you stand tall and do the best you can financially as you can. I know we're still struggling. Uh, I'm still not working my secular job, but I just thank God that he continues to provide. And I know he's gonna provide for you as well. So if you'd like to give today or right now, right there on the homepage for Crossroads Community Church right here on Facebook, you'll see the little icon there that says, sign up. And if you'll take a moment, click on that, it'll take you directly to the GiveLify app where you can give any amount you'd like. Or if you're on your phone or your mobile device, you can do the same thing. Simply click on the little icon there on the right where it says sign up, and it'll take you to the GiveLify app where you can give, again, any amount you'd like. I just want to thank you for being here today. I just thank you and I love you. My prayers go out to you. All of our families who have been involved in, in so much devastation, whether the coronavirus and family lost members and things of that nature or, or due to the, the hurricane that just blew through, all of this that's going on, we've got lots to be praying about and we're praying for you today as well. And I just want to let you know this has been Pastor Bob Barker with Crossroads Today, wishing you a beautiful day today. And remember that God's miracles are yours today. And I will see you right here next Sunday. God bless you.